You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. Space. The final frontier. These are the continuing voyages of the starship Enterprise. Your ongoing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life forms and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. My son's legal name is Luke Skywalker. So there's no doubt where I fall on the old Star Trek, Star Wars debate and who's the best and who's the favorite. I was always a Star Wars fan and that has a lot to do with simply timing. Uh, Being born in 1971, I was uh, five when Star Wars was released to theaters. So... Uh, from, you know, the, the moment I was uh, cognizant and coherent, I was into Star Wars. And I can remember when I was uh, when I was 12, I was in the seventh grade. My teacher, Mr. Benton, I've talked about Mr. Benton before uh, in the in the drunks episode. He was a big influence on my life. And I remember very vividly having a conversation with him one time where I asked and I said, uh, Oh, you know, my, my 12-year-old voice. I wonder, uh, Mr. Simpson. I mean, that's what I sounded like, pimply-faced teen. Uh, I asked Mr. Benton, I wonder what I would be into if Star Wars hadn't come around. And he didn't flinch. He said, you'd be into Star Trek. And I said, I, what? No way. I would, Star Trek? I'm not into Star Trek. And it's funny to think, like, there was such a, a a divide in the fandom way back then. Like you had to pick your side, you know. The Star Wars kids uh, picked up <clears throat> uh, uh, wrapping paper rolls and used them as lightsabers to beat the crap out of their siblings. And the Star Trek kids uh, explored new worlds and tried not to disturb anybody. I mean, that's that's a a, a huge philosophical difference between the two uh properties you know star wars is about the rebellion and the evil empire being overthrown and star trek presented a much more a much more uh world of harmony where man had finally stopped worrying about material possessions and money and instead had looked towards bettering themselves and seeking out new life you know so uh it's interesting how i got into star trek the first star trek i can remember watching now the the tv shows were in syndication forever you know they were always on uh here in la they were on channel 13 uh, at 11 o'clock almost every night of my childhood they were on and all i can remember is um this is going to sound totally bizarre, but there used to be a product called Contact, and it was a uh, like a cold medicine. And the commercial featured uh, a close up of this this capsule, and it was being opened by giant fingers, and all these little tiny beads were falling out, and that was all of the medicine inside Contact. And when they showed commercials for Star Trek, they normally showed like. Kirkin and Spock and McCoy beaming up and it looked like the same kind of effect like all these little sparklies so I never got into like Star Trek as a kid I the 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 commercials that they aired made it look and this is crazy in retrospect you know with hindsight but the commercials made it look silly like they were always showing Kirk uh, there's a shot of him being hit with a phaser and he's sort of like going uh, you know in, in perfect Shatner form but uh, 
No, I, it, it simply didn't appeal to me. It seemed after the uh, bravado uh, fireworks of the Star Wars films, the melancholy, let's talk things over world of Star Trek seemed a little blasé, a little dull. Um, and I'm here to, I'm, you know, I'm obviously saying I was completely wrong. But the first Star Trek I ever watched, this is interesting, uh, Star Trek Three because obviously it had Christopher Lloyd in it. So my brother had a VHS copy of it and I put it in and it was interesting because, you know, Star Trek three, if you're starting in the middle, you know, and by this time, um, this is the latest Star Trek film. Star Trek six has not come out. Excuse me. Star Trek four has not come out in theaters, but Star Trek three is available. And I remember watching it and just being really, um, confused because it's called the search for Spock and the minute they find him the movie ends and I just remember thinking like where's the rest of the movie but you know you live and learn and sometimes when you're a dumb teenager which I was it takes a while for you to really appreciate things that are well made you know you're so eager for a quick hit you know I need that for that brand new sci-fi movie that's coming out let's go see that what about all this other sci-fi? Ah, that's old people stuff. And then you grow up. And what happened was uh, I met a guy named Greg Stone. And Greg Stone was an older guy. I've talked about him before. He was like my Doc Brown. And Greg was the biggest Star Trek fan I had ever met. And that's not hyperbole. Like, when we finally went into... Like, we met... Um, we met Greg on the way to a sci-fi convention. Of course we did. Of course we did. And uh, I rode up with him, and we just talked about this and that. And I told me I was a Star Wars guy, and he was a Star Trek guy. And I didn't quite get it. You know, I'm still not getting it. And then when we finally went into Greg's apartment, like, I was blown away. Because here, I, my room was wall-to-wall -wall Star Wars. I had all the vehicles, all the play sets, all the figures, all the posters. I had a Star Wars trash can. I had Star Wars t-shirts. Uh, I lived and breathed and bathed in Star Wars, you know, with my Princess Leia bubble bath. I'm not kidding. But Greg, Greg wasn't just like a fanboy. Greg was obsessed. And Greg had like a pretty sparse apartment but the stuff that he had was unbelievable. So Greg's got a pretty big TV, and we were there to watch um, Star Trek IV on VHS. It had just come out on VHS, and the big deal was that it had a preview of Next Generation on it. Now, I was pretty interested in watching Next Generation because I, you know, it was new. It was a new thing. So it's not the old fuddy-duddy Star Trek, right? So we go into Greg's house, and Greg doesn't have a couch. Greg has a replica of Captain Kirk's command chair from the original Enterprise. Full, detailed replica on a platform, just like Kirk's was. So Greg's sitting there watching Star Trek from this chair, and I just was like, you know what? I thought I was a big fan of something, but this guy takes the cake. He had Star Trek everywhere. And it was all high-end stuff, you know, uh, beautiful models of the Enterprise and um, commissioned works of art from conventions, you know, high-end stuff, not just crappy little toys. And Greg's thing was he did a lot of prop replicas. So we watched Star Trek Four there. And you know what? Star Trek Four is a masterpiece. You know, it's set in the present day. It's about conservation. Uh Obviously, I don't need to go into a review of all the Star Trek films, except to say that Star Trek IV was so good, it caused me to reevaluate my entire opinion on the Trek franchise. So, and, and it had a lot to do with, it had less to do with spaceships and laser guns, you know, and phaser battles, and more to do with and the reason Star Trek IV is so good is that it's about the characters. And every character in Star Trek IV has their moment of shining in the light. 
And obviously the, the biggest is the relationship between Kirk and Spock. Kirk has just brought Spock back from the dead. So they're becoming friends all over again. And you, the audience, get to, wit get to witness that for the first time again. So obviously this ignited like, hey, you know, this isn't too bad. This is pretty good. So I started watching Star Trek late at night and really enjoying the old episodes, you know, for a low budget sci-fi series. They really, I mean, they had some of the greatest sci-fi writers of all time. You know, Harlan Ellison's City on the Edge of Forever is one of the best hours of science fiction you'll ever watch. You know, when Kirk, when Kirk has to let Edith Keeler get hit by a car and watch it happen, it is like your heart breaks. And this is a, a little TV show. You know, this is a, what, 44-minute TV show, and it's absolutely brilliant. And again, it's about characters. It's about characters. And when I got into, you know, liking Star Trek, and then obviously Next Generation ramped up, and Next Generation was just, you know, other than, you know, they, did, they stumbled a few times. Encounter at Farpoint is not a very good episode to start off. Uh, you know, they have to separate the saucer and introduce everybody, blah, blah, blah. You know, there are children on the Enterprise. Uh, but when they finally picked up Speed, Next Generation, some of those episodes are are equal to the original and some surpass it. You know, some of them like um, Relics, where they find uh, Mr. Scott embedded in a, in a transporter loop. Uh, and he gets drunk on the set of the original Enterprise. Like some of them are just absolutely brilliant. Um, Inner Light. Inner Light is uh, where Picard is hit by a beam and finds himself on a planet and lives an entire 50 year life uh, in an instant and has children and a life. And it when it, when it ends, like it's so heartbreaking that this life is being left behind. Um, yeah, Next Generation really got it got it right, but they wouldn't have got it right if they hadn't had the shoulders of the original series to build on, you know? And a big part of that was the camaraderie between William Shatner and Litter Nimoy as Kirk and Spock. Like, for whatever, whatever you know, you can say what you want about Roddenberry, um, so a lot of times, you know, Roddenberry and Lucas, these these guys create these things, and one person has a tough time wrestling with with ideas and and sagas this big. You know, look at I mean, the exception to the rule might be George R. R. Martin, who's managed to maintain tight control and direction over Game of Thrones, but Roddenberry. Um, he needed a little help and got some of the greatest writers of the age to come in and pen Star Trek episodes and really flesh out who these characters were and how they acted with each other. And the, the cold stalwart Vulcan being paired with the hot headed, uh, you know, Iowa, uh, captain, created such a great dynamic because they played so well off of each other. And I've read all of the books, you know, the, the, the thing I do when I delve in obviously is absorb everything that I can. And the books are fascinating because they really tell you what it was like, like as fans, you only see the finished product, but to find out like, that Nimoy was hesitant to take the part. And then when he did take the part of Spock, he was very um, involved in the in the the molding of the character to make it really special and really stand out. Now he would have later later in life issues with the Spock character. Obviously he wrote a book, I Am Not Spock, and then had to write another book called I Am Spock. So he had a lot of... Uh, a love-hate relationship with the character. And that's probably a lot to do simply with with wrestling with how popular the character got. Like, you, you think nowadays, like, TV and, and, and film properties, everything is so splintered and niche, you know? Like, 
whatever you're into, there's somebody that's creating something that's going to fit the bill. But back in the day, you watch what was on the five channels that were on, you know, and everybody, uh, youngish, uh, nerdish, watched Star Trek. And he was getting thousands of fan letters a week. And this is when you had to put pen to paper and put a stamp on it and get it in the mail. And you can see, like, for a guy like Nimoy, who before, look at his IMDb page. Before Star Trek, he had tons of TV credits. And all of a sudden, he's got this part that is going to take over and define him for the rest of his life. Like, that's got to be an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic in your life. Like all of us who struggle each day with paying the bills and and finding time for our families, we look at things like that and we say, if somebody offered me the chance to be an alien on a show that was going to define me forever, we, would, we wouldn't hesitate. For a paycheck like that, we wouldn't hesitate. But that's not always the case. And sometimes people pass on things because they don't want to be defined by a single role. And Nimoy, he was so good as Spock that it was inevitable that he was going to be Spock forever. So when the, when the show ended, you know, three out of its five-year run that it was supposed to have, uh, he went to the stage. Uh, but that didn't stop him from coming back for the animated show. And the animated show, if you've never seen it, is actually very good because, again... Again, they got great writers and they wrote smart sci-fi stories and they didn't talk down or make kitty fair, you know? Star Trek may be a lot of things, but kitty fair it's not. Just because they're in a spaceship with phasers and tricorders doesn't mean that it's a kid show. You know, that's the, the, the mistake a lot of people make. But... When I delved back into discovering Star Trek, I discovered so many of the great original episodes and then uh, the not so great motion picture. Uh, and then and then you see Star Trek two and any notions you had that Star Trek couldn't be exciting sci fi and not just thought provoking is blown out of the water. Because Wrath of Khan's a, a total masterpiece. It's basically a submarine movie redressed as spaceships with two volatile captains never giving up and fighting to the death. And Star Trek 2 is a masterpiece. And <clears throat> when you read back... And you know, this, this show's not really here to give you a full history of, of Star Trek. You can get that almost anywhere. But it's interesting to note as a uh, piece of trivia and an insight into who Leonard Nimoy was, was that after motion pictures sort of, now it did okay at the box office, uh, um, but critically it was a flop because it, it's slow, it's boring. And when they ramped up to do a sequel, they wanted to do it cheaper. They didn't want to spend as much money on anything. And when they, was, when they approached Leonard Nimoy, he simply said, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be Spock anymore. You've killed it with this crappy movie. We're all done. You had your big shot. You know, Star Wars made a ton of money at the box office. So Paramount wanted their space saga. And I'm done because you had your chance. And then he thought about it. And he, he had this idea like, I'll do it. If you if you kill Mr. Spock now that that must have been a huge decision you know because Nicholas Meyer the writer director uh, who would who had previously done uh, the amazing time after time which uh, my good friend John Ray just let me borrow it's sitting right here in my desk I cannot wait to watch it again but Nicholas Meyer was like yes that's a great idea so Nimoy signed and it's interesting that in a time before the internet word got out that they were going to kill Mr. Spock 
and people lost their minds. So they had the brilliant idea of killing him in the first 10 minutes in the Kobe, Kobayashi Maru simulator. So that put the entire audience at ease. And you know what? That's just great filmmaking. So that when they enter the Mutara Nebula near the end and the warp, uh, the warp engines are breached, when Spock runs down to do what he can, you're not aware till it's too late that Spock is sacrificing himself so that everybody can get out. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, of the one. And I'll tell you, that scene with Kirk and Spock separated by the glass and Spock dying and Kirk unable to do anything and Captain Kirk for the first time having to face the no-win scenario and it's his best friend... That's just, that's what the movies are about. That's good storytelling. That's why we go. And as awful as it was to say goodbye to Spock in that moment. And you know, in his book, Spock talks about, or Spock, Nimoy talks about being very hesitant to want to shoot that scene. Like they knew it was coming. Everybody knew it was coming. And then the time comes where, hey, we're going to film Spock's death. Like, that's a big deal, you know? At the time, we're less than, um, we're less than 20 years from the original show. And for all intents and purposes, we're putting the cap on a character beloved by so many. And he had a real tough time doing it. And we, the audience, had a tough time watching it. You know? When Kirk runs for the chamber and Scotty grabs him, you'll flood the whole compartment. He'll die. He's already dead. Like, powerful, powerful stuff. And what happened was that that sequence begat the, the, the great run of Star Trek movies. You know, two leads right into three, and they lured Nimoy back to three by offering him the director's chair, which was perfect because, again, Spock doesn't show up as a character to the last five minutes and Star Trek three, even though I loathed it the first time I watched it, uh, when I finally watched it in order, it's a powerful movie because Kirk is again having to face the unthinkable and that's death. And this time in three, it's the death of his son, David and the death of the Genesis planet. And they're undoing everything that, that Kirk's son and his uh, ex-lover, uh, Kirk's ex-lover, had worked so hard. They had cheated. And the Genesis device was a weapon. And, of course, the Klingons won it. And it's Christopher Lloyd and John Larroquette, you know, and has great scenes. The, the scene where Sulu and Uhura rescue uh, McCoy from the brig don't call me tidy. I mean, fantastic stuff. Really fantastic stuff. And three is great because, yes, it ends on a cliffhanger, but that's great because that, that locked them into four. And when they, you know, regroup to do four, and again, Nimoy directed, uh, you got a totally different movie. You got a light in tone. Um, fish out of water comedy featuring the characters that we love in situations that we the audience were completely familiar with and Star Trek 4 went on to become at the time the highest grossing film of the series you know Voyage Home's a, a fantastic movie you know I'm from Iowa I only work in outer space when she says he's just gonna stay in the park and Kirk looks at Spock and goes it's his way. Um, great, great movie. Um, now, <laughs> before Star Trek V will hit theaters, uh, Nimoy will continue directing. He directed um, The Good Mother, which is um, a movie where, it, this is bizarre, a movie where Liam Neeson, um, this is all from memory, folks. I, I have the IMDb page, but I'm actually not looking at it. I'm actually on something else. But if I remember, The Good Mother is about a woman who, uh, I believe it's Natasha Richardson. If I, no, mm, 
I really should look it up. But Liam Neeson's in it, and Liam Neeson ends up taking a shower with a young child. Uh, totally innocent, innocuous, but it sparks a debate over what makes a good parent. Um, but Nimoy was stretching as a director, and he would use that to direct a monster hit, and that is Three Men and a Baby. Like, monster, monster movie. It's hard to describe to people today how big a movie that was with three you know big stars ted dance and tom Selleck and you know steve gutenberg but uh massive massive hit at the box office and really cemented nimoy as a guy who could direct uh something other than star trek which for him must have been so gratifying and i, sh I should also say that there's a little known thing because after Star Trek uh, ended and he did the animated show, he uh, ended up on Mission Impossible. And then he did a show that I used to watch. It was on Saturday nights. It was called In Search Of. And he narrated. And it was just about the, the supernatural, the paranormal. And <clears throat> like for a guy like me who grew up obsessed with That's Incredible, uh, real people um, Ripley's believe it or not the Guinness Booker World Records uh, in search of was right in line with oh I just loved it there was a particular episode that I was fascinated with and it actually not that long ago went and watched it on YouTube it's about a guy in Florida who made a uh, uh, I think it's a coral garden or a rock garden by himself without any kind of um, power tools and nobody knows how he was able to lift all of the blocks into their positions and I just I found that fascinating like this guy had some sort of supernatural or superpowers and uh, the episode's still pretty fascinating and I guess the thing is still open you can still go and and tour it wherever it is in Florida so I'm going to add that to my bucket list and say that it's Thanks to Leonard Nimoy that I want to go. Um, I want to go visit. And then uh, Nimoy would be lured back, obviously, for Star Trek V. Uh, this time, the director's uh, chair was Shatner, and you know, not to, not to go into bashing Five. It's been bashed enough. Uh, Shatner, Shatner's um, uh, like I, I talked about Five in my 1989 episode. But uh, the, the studio cut him off at the knees. Um, and the funniest thing that can be said about Star Trek V is that his rock monster that got cut because the costume was so bad. And you can actually see pictures on the internet of the rock monster costume. It looks like something that you'd uh, rent at a party store. But uh, Galaxy Quest paid homage to that by putting a rock monster in it. And that's a direct wink to Shatner's uh, never seen rock monster. You know, not seen on film. So... Star Trek V, as bad as it is, uh, worth watching if you're a Trek fan, and I am, uh, for the scenes in uh, the the in uh, Yellowstone where they're they're camping and singing "Row, row, row your boat," and they're just being friends because ultimately, again, that's why we watch these movies. And as they're gearing up for. Star Trek VI, um, The Undiscovered Country, which was billed as the final voyage of the original crew because they were going to hand over the reins to Next Generation. Uh, there was kind of a double whammy in that Star Trek VI, they brought back Nicholas Meyer and he put it uh, back in his sort of military world and they did a military plot. But... Uh, uh, at the same time, Spock is is making his appearance on Next Generation, and what that was was kind of like bridging the gap because uh, McCoy had appeared on Encounter at Farpoint, very old, in old age makeup, but this was the first like um, integral part of the plot because Spock's um, role was much bigger as he's trying to broker peace between, I think it's, you know, the Romulans and uh, the Federation. But what was great with that was uh, like what I always talk about, there were toys. 
you know there hadn't been a lot of star trek toys up till this point there had been obviously the the um iconic mego figures but without the internet in the in the time frame i was collecting those figures were were not common even though i mean they're common now and they've been re-released a million times but they weren't very common back then and <clears throat> that didn't leave a lot of options so star trek toys were not part of my growing up because they simply weren't available the motion picture amigos the smaller ones those showed up occasionally but you know what uh compared to star wars figures of the same day those figures don't hold up they don't have paint on their faces the uniforms that they're reproducing were so bland and boring that they didn't really register and there wouldn't be toys until three ljn put out kirk spock mccoy and uh, uh commander krug right but um those were pretty hard to get I had a couple of them from some cons just as, uh, you know, because they were cool, but they were pretty hard to get. And they there was nothing, it was interesting, there was nothing for four, even though four was the big hit, there were no figures for four. Now for five, for five, there were these big um, applause uh, vinyl-like dolls. They didn't move or anything, they were very boring. Um, I've never been into static statues i've always been an action figure guy so those didn't appeal to me and the movie didn't appeal so buying figures to reenact the thing at home did not no it was no sorry uh and then interestingly enough for six there were no toys there were no toys for star trek six obviously there have been metal die cast enterprises all through the runs of various shapes and sizes um those are fun, and I enjoy those now. I, I was an Enterprise hanging from my ceiling right now next to a TIE bomber from Empire Strikes Back. But without the ability to put the figures in them, they become more like space Hot Wheels. You know what I mean? I mean, does that, does that moniker sound right? But that's just the way it goes. And it wasn't until Next Generation, you know, Galoob put out toys for next generation and they were terrible they're so boring uh these are some of the first toys to ever have the weapon molded into their hand so they didn't have to include any accessories in the pack um i collected a few of those they were really hard to get especially um tasha yar because by the time the toys were really hitting they had already killed off tasha yar on the show I don't think the Wesley character shipped hardly anywhere. And the big Enterprise bridge that was promised on the back of the pack never came out. Uh, they did a shuttlecraft and a couple other things, but they were, they were pretty boring. And if you look them up on eBay, they're laughably bad. But then Galoob was never known really for action figures. They are micro machines and they are, again, static figures. So, um, you can imagine when Playmates picked up the license for Star Trek for Next Generation, the first figures they put out were they were they were beautiful figures um, compared to what was else else was in the market. These were these were top of the line, you know. And it's funny to think like that's um, oh my gosh, eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety, and uh, those figures those star trek playmates figures are better than any figure on the market right now in a comparable price range go look those figures were 5.99 go look at a 5.99 figure now the 5.99 avengers figures look like something you would get out of a uh, 25 or 50 cent vending machine in in comparison and they were always lauded not lauded they were always ridiculed for having eh, the heads are too big they don't uh, you don't know what you got till you ain't got it no more. And the toys today are awful. Uh, to get a decent figure of any license you want, it's $20. That's, that's ridiculous. That eliminates kids from collecting. It really does. But back in the day, man, Playmates put out so many Star Trek figures, it was hard to keep up. But you know what? For a while, I had them all. I bought them all and the original series ones were the best because they came out with uh, ambassador Spock and I was like oh finally 
I can have the Star Trek figures I want. And then they put out the set of the original bridge. So you had all the characters. And you finally got uh, an original series Spock figure done in a modern day uh, toy era. And then they just cranked out so many. They did all. They did the motion picture ones. They did Star Trek VI. They did a build a set where if you collected them all, you built V'ger from motion picture. They did Christopher Lloyd as Commander Krug. Um, Khan, you name it. You could build the Genesis device. So those were, those were great. And when that line ended, I mean, what happened was the end of that line they lost all their articulation at the same time the price went up and uh they killed their own line it just that's the way it goes it was the last few the last series or so which had seven and nine and the borg queen uh never saw them at retail very hard to get uh not super valuable now but you know elusive even managed to get a um Captain Picard NCC one seven zero one Picard from Tapestry, which at the which continues to be one of the rarest retail figures of the last twenty twenty five years. Um, I bought that at Spencer Gifts for seven ninety nine and sold it for five hundred dollars the next day. Like I was shocked. Um, that was that was fantastic. And then they re-released it so I could buy it and actually have a displayable one that wasn't worth so much. But through it all, through the, all the incarnations, and uh, Star Trek VI, Spock's fantastic. You know, he's the one leading the murder mystery and quoting Sherlock Holmes, you know, and, and mind-melding forcibly with, with Kim Cattrall and you know plucking her thoughts in a violent way that that offends even spock while he's doing it uh star trek 6 also features a very bizarre cameo by christian slater i'm not sure what that's about has sulu as a captain and you know what star trek 6 is a great movie and it was a really great way to have the original series Stars ride off into the cinematic sunset and hand the reins to the next generation. And it ends with their signatures and second star to the right. And it ends on such a high note. Nobody dies. They don't destroy the Enterprise anymore. And you're just left. I remember walking out of the theater like feeling great. Like this is the capper to a journey that I took a lot later than a lot of people, but that guys who had watched the original show and girls got to see the crew take off and end in a really respectable and honorable way. And, you know, that's all you can ask for in a film franchise. Now, they would get Shatner back for generations to bridge the gap between the two captains, two captains, one destiny. Um, and Generations is not a bad movie. It has some some low points, but uh, not a bad movie. Uh, they had to destroy the Enterprise, of course. I mean, that's just par for the course. Blow it up. Get a new one. And then they would move on to, you know, First Contact and uh, Insurrection and uh, Nemesis. <laughs> Nemesis. Um, and uh, then they, you know, they would have those cameos on television, like I said, Relics is just fantastic. And uh, then Star Trek was dead for a while. Nemesis effectively killed the franchise for a while. And when they talked about rebooting it and going back to Kirk and Spock in the Academy, that harkened back to a script that's been around for a long time. It was Harv Bennett who wanted to take Kirk and Spock back to the Academy days and only feature cameos at the beginning and end of, of uh, Shatner and Nimoy sort of bookending it and giving their stamp of approval to this new crew. So when they announced they were rebooting it with JJ Abrams, I immediately went back to that script. That must be what it is. And I enjoyed the 2009 Star Trek. It's a bizarre movie in that it undoes the timeline of the original series and in a canon way says none of that ever happened and that's kind of a um a bitter pill to swallow 
to think that all those adventures that we enjoyed so much never happened. But that only means it never happened in the context of that film. And when you think about Star Trek, the original series, the wagon train to the stars, you can't take it away. And you can't take away the cultural impact that that crew had on society. And what an upbeat and positive message that Star Trek had for anybody who watched. Again, I was too young to watch it when I was a kid. But imagine if you were a kid, and here's this show that says that not only is mankind going to leave Earth and travel the stars, but they're going to do it colorblind. And Uhura, the black woman, is going to be the, the communications officer. And Chekhov, the Russian, in the height of the Cold War, is going to commandeer the ship along with Mr. Sulu, a guy who had spent his youth in a Japanese concentration camp here in America. What a positive message. And it was led by the fact that they were going to let an alien, Mr. Spock, be the science officer. What a positive message. And Leonard Nimoy had a lot to do with that. He's the one that came up with the Vulcan nerve pinch and the Vulcan salute, which was a Jewish salute. And... If there's anything you can say to a guy like Leonard Nimoy who made such a cultural impact is you say this, you say thanks. You say thanks for being so passionate about your character and wanting to do the very best that you can, that you never settled for something second rate and you became the guardian of Mr. Spock. So much so that Zachary Kinto, who took over the role, wouldn't have done it without your blessing. And when I saw Star Trek, the new one, the 2009 version in the theater, when Captain Kirk falls into that ice, you know, ice cave, and suddenly there's Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock, I teared up, you know, I'm a big softy, and his line about I have been and always will be your friend oh man again I've said it before I'll say it again that's what going to the movies is about and seeing him in that movie was like an old friend like he, he shows up in the beginning in that little the little uh, flippy ship that, that flies around right so you knew he was going to show up somewhere uh but when he does and he, and he delivers the line, like, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, I really dig that. That's not to say him saying the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many that he said in Transformers Dark of the Moon didn't piss me off. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm not here to bring that up, and I shouldn't have brought it up, but it's, I did. You know, because he's also part of the Transformers universe in both the animated film Galvatron and Dark of the Moon. But he's forgiven because look at what he brought to pop culture. You know, I grok Spock. <laughs> I grok Spock. And we can also thank him for Star Trek Into Darkness for giving us what I call the Spaceballs moment because basically... They dial up. When does this happen in the movie? Now. We're looking at now now. I mean, they call him up to find out what happened with Khan. And uh, that's basically putting in Spaceballs the movie and fast forwarding to find out where they went. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I get it. You know, that's a fun moment. I'm, I'm okay with it. At least the Spot character had the sense enough to go, look, I can't tell you. This is a different timeline. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and I'm not here to give a review of Into Darkness because it would not be pretty because it has a lot of problems but it doesn't matter because you uh, what uh, Orzo and Kurtzman those two guys who write every genre pick you can say all you want that you're negating all of the canon timeline that came before and you're rewriting your own way into the future it doesn't matter because you'll never take away the original series. You'll never take away Next Generation. You'll never take away Star Trek 1 through 6 featuring the original crew. And how they transcended a television show that got canceled 
to make some of the best sci-fi movies that have ever been released. That's saying something. If you want to know what it's like, like I wish I could have been on Star Trek. I, I, I walked the sets of Next Generation. I sat in the captain's chair, went to sick bay, never appeared on the show, never appeared in the movies, went to the opening of Star Trek, uh, the live adventure at Universal Studios. That was pretty badass. But it was never part of the, the show. You know, I'm, I'm an outside observer. But it looked to me as if, other than a few squabbles here and there, because I know that Jimmy Doohan never got along with William Shatner, and there were always sibling rivalries. But it looked to me like a family. Like those people were a family, you know? And watch the end of Star Trek Four when they get back to the future, pardon the pun, and they release the whales, and the whales are in the water. That's the um, that's the parking lot of Paramount Studios. Uh, the parking lot is sunken in so that they can fill it with water and film there. That's done on the back lot, and when they start throwing each other into the water, Nimoy basically says, keep rolling because this is good, because that's a real moment between real friends having a great time. Throwing each other in the water, and Nimoy, Mr. Spock, for all his calm demeanor and Vulcan emotionless uh, way of life, looks like he's having a great time. And that, my friends, is what it's all about. So, yes, we can be sad that Leonard Nimoy passed away, but we can also be incredibly thankful and happy that this guy spent his life providing to us some of the finest most fun entertainment ever and that's a legacy that's going to last forever and if i could live to the ripe old age of 83 and look back at so many different ways i contributed to pop culture i would call myself complete and done and while I was sad yesterday that Nimoy passed away, I also know that how he went was probably pretty bad. He was probably suffering, and this might have been um, the only way to end that suffering. And having been around people who are in the throes of some of the worst pain ever and watching them pass away and knowing that at least for now, the pain has ended, that's a positive thing. And as I look back at discovering Star Trek through Greg and really enjoying rediscovering all of those episodes that I had avoided for so long and immersing myself in the characters, I find that even though I don't have a son named Mr. Spock or <laughs> Kirk Tucker or uh, <laughs> you know this is Captain James T. Tucker like I don't have that what I do have is a um, a profound respect for the amazing groundbreaking sci-fi work that those guys did at a time when that just was impossible to do and yet they did it and there's a reason that Nichelle Nichols was about to quit because Uhura wasn't getting enough dialogue and Martin Luther King told her not to quit. He said, you being on the Enterprise gives hope to everybody that the future is going to be better than it is now. And she stayed and became a role model. And her and Captain Kirk shared the first interracial kiss on television. A lot of taboos were broken because they covered it up in wink wink sci-fi trappings and and i'm privileged to know now uh, a very talented guy named scott tipton who works for idw comics who just recently wrote the comic version of city on the edge of forever using harlan ellison's uh, complete script and right now scott's working on uh, a star trek planet of the apes crossover 
called the Primate Directive. And let me tell you, that's brilliant. And I'm privileged to know, Scott, a guy who is right now immersed in Star Trek and gets to put words into Mr. Spock's mouth. I mean, that's pretty cool. I'm a little jealous, but that's okay because we all got our thing. So I'm going to go on my stuff tonight. I'm going to dig out my Mr. Spock action figure and try to find it. I know I've got three or four. I've got Spock the ambassador, Spock the one on the bridge, um, motion picture Spock, <laughs> Wrath of Khan Spock, Star Trek 3, I just a whole bunch. And uh, drink some, I, you know, I know I'm not a drinker, but I'll drink in theory some Romulan ale. Guess who's coming to dinner? And toast Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, the host of In Search Of, the guy with some of the funniest one-liners on his two appearances on The Simpsons. When he's in the monorail episode and he goes, well, my work here is finished. And the guy goes, you didn't do anything. And he goes, didn't I? I mean, didn't I? And he didn't do anything. He goes, what do you want on your hot dog, Spock? Surprise me. You know, he was also in the episode where Mr. Burns is mistaken for an alien. Uh, he's aping his um, in search of persona. From this simple man came proof of the extraterrestrial life you know he, oh man he's gone Nimoy's gone and with it we're left with um, one less member of the Star Trek crew he joins Scotty and uh, Bones you know he joins Scotty and Bones they have boldly gone getting melancholy at the end here you know that's just the way it goes but uh, what are you going to do? This is what happens. And it really sucks. Because what happens is you, you latch on to these things in your life. For me, it's movies and TV shows. And you, um, you grow up with them. And for you, they stand still because they're captured forever in a VHS tape or a DVD disc or a digital download now and they don't age they're like Mr. Spock excuse me they're like Mr. Scotty caught in that transporter loop never aging caught in a moment in time but the reality is all your heroes every day are getting older and eventually you have to say goodbye to them and it really sucks. You know, I've watched my personal hero, Michael J. Fox, be stricken with Parkinson's and have to alter his whole career and change the way he does things. You know? Although, you know, the way it's going, Shatner's going to outlive us all. The guy doesn't seem to ha have any effects of aging. He's the same age as Nimoy. But he's, he never slows down. I think if Shatner slowed down, that'd be the time that uh, death finally caught up with him. He runs too fast. But uh, as, as I assume the mantle of King of the Nerds just for today, somebody else can have it tomorrow. I will say a big thank you to Leonard Nimoy for so many years of thoughtful, thought-provoking science fiction in an age where it was easy just to have gunfights. They strove, strived for something more and they got it. And the TV shows and the movies and the legacy he leaves behind will never be taken away. And he's made his mark. And all the Bilbo Baggins and Proud Mary recordings and is that or is it not a ghost in the window of three men and a baby cannot take away the cultural impact of Nimoy's work. So thanks, Mr. Nimoy. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I'm just a tiny guy offering his tiny opinion about somebody so great. I am the voice of 99 reasons. I am Jeff Tucker. Thanks for listening. 
live long and prosper. Listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening? <laughs>